do not let people drag you into their petty fights and squabbles. Seem interested and supportive, but find a way to remain neutral, let others do the fighting while you stand back, watch and wait. When the fighting parties are good and tired, they will be ripe for the picking. You can make it a practice, in fact, to stir up quarrels between other people, and then offer to mediate, gaining power as the go-between. To succeed in the game of power, you have to master your emotions. But even if you succeed in gaining such self-control, you can never control the temperamental dispositions of those around you. And this presents a great danger. Most people operate in a whirlpool of emotions, constantly reacting, churning up squabbles and conflicts. Your self-control and autonomy will only bother and infuriate them. They will try to draw you into the whirlpool, begging you to take sides in their endless battles, or to make peace for them. If you succumb to their emotional entreaties, little by little you will find your mind and time occupied by their problems. Do not allow whatever compassion and pity you possess to suck you in. You can never win in this game, the conflicts can only multiply. On the other hand, you cannot completely stand aside, for that would cause needless offence. To play the game properly, you must seem interested in other people's problems, even sometimes appear to take their side. But while you make outward gestures of support, you must maintain your inner energy and sanity by keeping your emotions disengaged. No matter how hard people try to pull you in, never let your interest in their affairs and petty squabbles go beyond the surface. Give them gifts, listen with a sympathetic look, even occasionally play the charmer but inwardly keep both the friendly kings and the perfidious borgers at arm's length. By refusing to commit and thus maintaining your autonomy you retain the initiative, your moves stay matters of your own choosing, not defensive reactions to the push and pull of those around you. Slowness to pick up your weapons can be a weapon itself, especially if you let other people exhaust themselves fighting, then take advantage of their exhaustion. In ancient China, the kingdom of Qin once invaded the kingdom of Hsing. Huan, the ruler of a nearby province, thought he should rush to Hsing's defense, but his advisor counseled him to wait, Hsing is not yet going to ruin, he said, and Qin is not yet exhausted. If China is not exhausted, we cannot become very influential. Moreover, the merit of supporting a state in danger is not as great as the virtue of reviving a ruined one. The advisor's argument won the day, and as he had predicted, Quan later had the glory both of rescuing Hsing from the brink of destruction and then of conquering an exhausted Qin. He stayed out of the fighting until the forces engaged in it had worn each other down, at which point it was safe for him to intervene. That is what holding back from the fray allows you, time to position yourself to take advantage of the situation once one side starts to lose. You can also take the game a step further by promising your support to both sides in a conflict while maneuvering so that the one to come out ahead in the struggle is you. This was what Castruccio Castracani, ruler of the Italian town of Lucca in the 14th century, did when he had designs on the town of Pistoia. A siege would have been expensive, costing both lives and money, but Castruccio knew that Pistoia contained two real factions, the blacks and the whites, which hated one another. He negotiated with the blacks, promising to help them against the whites, then, without their knowledge, he promised the whites he would help them against the blacks and Castruccio kept his promises he sent an army to a black-controlled gate to the city, which the sentries of course welcomed in. Meanwhile another of his armies entered through a white-controlled gate. The two armies united in the middle, occupied the town, killed the leaders of both factions, ended the internal war, and took Pistoia for Castruccio. Preserving your autonomy gives you options, when people come to blows you can play the mediator, broker the peace, while really securing your own interests. You can pledge support to one side and the other may have to court you with a higher bid. Or, like Castruccio, you can appear to take both sides, then play the antagonists against each other. Oftentimes when a conflict breaks out, you are tempted to side with the stronger party, or the one that offers you apparent advantages in an alliance. This is risky business. First, it is often difficult to foresee which side will prevail in the long run. But even if you guess right and ally yourself with the stronger party, you may find yourself swallowed up and lost, or conveniently forgotten, when they become victors. Side with the weaker, on the other hand, and you are doomed. But play a waiting game and you cannot lose. In France's July Revolution of 1830, after three days of riots, the statesman Talleyrand, 
now elderly, sat by his Paris window, listening to the pealing bells that signaled the riots were over. Turning to an assistant, he said, Ah, the bells. We're winning. Whose are we, Mon Prince? the assistant asked. Gesturing for the man to keep quiet, Talleyrand replied, Not a word. I will tell you who we are tomorrow. He well knew that only fools rush into a situation that by committing too quickly you lose your maneuverability. People also respect you less, perhaps tomorrow, they think, you will commit to another, different cause, since you gave yourself so easily to this one. Good fortune is a fickle god and will often pass from one side to the other. Commitment to one side deprives you of the advantage of time and the luxury of waiting. Let others fall in love with this group or that, for your part don't rush in, don't lose your head. Finally, there are occasions when it is wisest to drop all pretense of appearing supportive and instead to trumpet your independence and self-reliance. The aristocratic pose of independence is particularly important for those who need to gain respect. George Washington recognized this in his work to establish the young American republic on firm ground. As president, Washington avoided the temptation of making an alliance with France or England, despite the pressure on him to do so. He wanted the country to earn the world's respect through its independence. Although a treaty with France might have helped in the short term, in the long run he knew it would be more effective to establish the nation's autonomy. Europe would have to see the United States as an equal power. Remember, you have only so much energy and so much time. Every moment wasted on the affairs of others subtracts from your strength. You may be afraid that people will condemn you as heartless, but in the end, maintaining your independence and self-reliance will gain you more respect and place you in a position of power from which you can choose to help others on your own initiative. Regard it as more courageous not to become involved in an engagement than to win in battle, and where there is already one interfering fool, take care that there shall not be two. Both parts of this law will turn against you if you take it too far. The game proposed here is delicate and difficult. If you play too many parties against one another, they will see through the maneuver and will gang up on you. If you keep your growing number of suitors waiting too long, you will inspire not desire, but distrust. People will start to lose interest. Eventually you may find it worthwhile to commit to one side if only for appearance's sake, to prove you are capable of attachment. Even then, however, the key will he to maintain your inner independence to keep yourself from getting emotionally involved. Preserve the unspoken option of being able to leave at any moment and reclaim your freedom if the side you are allied with starts to collapse. The friends you made while you were being courted will give you plenty of places to go once you jump ship.